right, go. Yes, Kevin. I talk too slow. You're doing just great, Kevin. Okay, go for it. Okay. Um, now, I understand you're not using this sheet, but the parameters that are in the computer come from this sheet, so uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit. Uh, and then this sheet was set up for either someone on an LBAT or BIBAT. Um, so it has a... Uh, I can't even see it. But it has a <laughs> left and right pump there and a left and right um, parameters. But anyway, regardless. Um, you're recording in the computer the drive pressure. Where do we see that? Oh, you see that on the that door. right there. The uh, diastolic or the, the vacuum during diastole, right there. The pump rate, where do we see that? It's right there, too. Mm -hmm. And the percent systole uh, is right there. So those numbers can come right there. Are they ever going to change? We hope not. No, and not unless some stupid perfusionist comes in here and changes it. Those are not <laughs> going to change. So every time you write them down, eh. yeah. now I just caution you: when you write these numbers down, just glance and look to make sure the pump is in fact doing what those numbers are that you're writing down. Um, you know, because you can just sit there at the computer and, oh, I'll do my uh, chart for the next five hours, but, you know, each time look and make sure that it's doing what you're writing down. So you That's say, really the important part. It's so not ver the number. verify that the waveform <laughs> That the waveform is doing what the settings say that it should be doing. Uh, now, the other part of that then is, is the pump completely filling and emptying? And here's the subjective part. If it's filling all the way like this, then we call that plus plus. If it's filling all the way except for a little dimple, oops, sorry. Bring it in close. Okay. Then we would call that plus minus. And if it's not filling well at all, like a big dimple in there, then we would call that minus minus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. We'll right. be calling somebody. Right. Also on emptying, if it's completely emptying on every beat, and it better be completely empty. That's one thing that's really not negotiable, that it completely empties. Uh, that diaphragm should be completely stretched on emptying, and you can say, well, I mean, and it's going at 60 beats per minute, so you have to go, yes, yes, <laughs> I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you have to look at it for a little while to, uh, you know, so you get confident, oh, yes, that it is completely emptying. But if it's, uh, so that's plus plus on the emptying. If it's uh, still got a little dimple in there, that's uh, plus minus. If it has a big dimple in there, then that's minus minus. And again, that's completely up to your subjective judgment as to what you make plus minus and minus minus and all that. But uh, it's the best we have, so you know that's what we got to do. Uh, but you know, like I said, in a few more weeks, no one's going to care what the pump's doing. But uh, anyway, now we have to, right now we have to be concerned. Uh, so. That's this sheet, but now it's in your, uh, what is it? The other thing that you're going to be inspecting for thrombus formations inside the pump, uh, and you can clearly see one here. I don't know as we've ever really had anything quite that large in one of our pumps, but, you know, you're going to see from time to time tiny specks in there. And certain times of the day, they'll be there. You come back later, they'll be gone. Where do they go? I, you know, this is part of her circulatory system. Her body has the ability to form a thrombus there and then dissolve it, just like it does in the rest of her body. Uh, so, you know, you're going to see specks in there that appear and disappear certain times of the day and whatever. Um, I can, you know... If the thrombus gets large enough, we're going to go back to the operating room and switch out the pump. 
that is not a benign procedure. Uh, you know, because we're going to shut down the pump, take it loose, have another one primed up, uh, reattach it, hope that we don't have air bubbles, or, well, we're going to try to eliminate all the air bubbles, uh, and at the same time hope that the cannulas don't clot up, and we'll probably have to fully anticoagulate her, which would, can cause other bleeding issues. Uh, they're not going to take her back to change this pump based on some tiny speck that we see inside the pump. It's got to get to where their comfort level is finally, okay, we can't take it anymore, now we're going to uh, take her back and change the pump. And that can be a, kind of a bone of contention between nursing and the docs. Because, you know, we'd like to change the pump out every little speck. But it's uh, it, it's uh, that's a risk to her uh, to her as well. She could die during that change out. So uh, you know we have to weigh that risk to the benefit of the change out. Uh, and uh, like I said, I don't get paid enough money to do that. These guys in the white or the white coats or whatever. You have a white no, coat we'll on. We'll make those decisions. <laughs> but, you know, don't get too upset when, you know, we start to see things growing in there and they won't change it out because it, it's it's no small feat to get that thing changed. So, um, uh, now, thrombus inside the pump. Are we using the sheets for, okay, we are using the sheets for that because there's no way to put that in the computer. Now, again, this is very subjective, but we have to have some way to track those deposits inside the device. Um, so, uh, on this sheet, the, the pump has every area has a number, uh, all, you know, the inflow, outflow, and the, the top, and, you know, whatever. There, there's numbers assigned to every area uh, of the pump. If you see a thrombus, uh, we'll say on the outflow of the of the pump uh, up here towards the top. So we would be looking in area, or it would be area number. Oh, my glasses. Ten. <laughs> area uh, according to the sheet, that's area ten there. If we saw a thrombus there, we would then go to this side of the page where we could record. Uh, that thrombus, so it has an area or a number for an, well, the date, the time, the area that the thrombus is in, and then we have to grade the size of the thrombus. And down here at the bottom of the page uh, are, is a guide to help you uh, uh, grade that. Did, do I have that on there? Yeah. Now, you know, a small letter means a small deposit, a capital letter means a big deposit. Now, what's the difference? Uh, I don't know. Again, it's very subjective. And then they've given you a couple of words to use there, like a punctual deposit. Uh, you know, I don't know what that is, but, you know, if you see something, choose one and write it down. And then we'll be able to follow that over time. And if it disappears later, then, you know, we'll be able to know that, too. But anyway, um, you know, it's not the greatest system, but that's all there is, so, uh, you know, we have to deal with that. Uh, anticoagulation monitoring, I, I hope someday we get back to this uh, uh, TIG. Well, I don't, we're, we have the machines, but we're not using them, but it might help us get a, a better handle on our anticoagulation, but uh, anyway, we're, we don't have that, so uh, we're not going to talk about it much. Um, you know, eventually they're going to approach her anticoagulation from a variety of directions, platelet inhibition, and, and, and all to try to keep uh, thrombus from forming in the device. Um, yeah. uh, just some happy pictures of children on beds, uh, but uh, we need to hurry along here. But, you know, I mean, it is, it's rewarding when you see these guys get transplanted and go back after being so uh, desperately ill. Um, uh, troubleshooting an error message. Uh, so, when you get an audible alarm, really, uh, you know, it, it, 
obviously the little light lights up and you hear a noise. Um, well, here, we can do that right here if you have an experience. That's pretty annoying. That, that's the alarm right there. And uh, we have a little red light here. Um, what your initial reaction to that should be is, how is the patient? Is the pump still filling and emptying? If it is, then that alarm is probably not a big issue. Um, but if it's not, we've got to take action. Now, uh, just, I, I don't mean to make fun of anyone, but one day with one of our other patients that we had on this, uh, I was over at the cardiovascular center and I get this page, get over here, the pump's alarming. And like, that was it. I, oh my God. <laughs> so I come running over and, you know, I'm not a real sprinter or anything. But I get over <laughs> um, and I hear this alarm. But the you know uh, the the child is sitting at a little desk coloring, and I'm like, hmm, well, it must not be that big a deal. So after my heart rate drop, uh, I start looking around, and I really don't see you know the little red lights on. I don't see any alarm here. Well, the bed was some kind of fancy bed that had an alarm on it, and the bed was alarming, but it sounded exactly like this console. Uh, so, moral of that story is, when you have an alarm, check the pump of the patient first, uh, and then, you know, because it may not even be this thing, it might be the bed or something else, but uh, anyway. Will it record, uh, Kevin, on there, on the comment screen? Uh, if there if was you, a true alarm? Right, right. So that would be another place to right. look. You can look. And uh, as you can see here, this one that I just activated is in red there because that was a critical thing. Um, you know, uh, it knows that it's not generating enough pressure to uh, generate a systole, so uh, obviously that's a critical alarm there. Uh, so, like we said, assess the patient, assess the pump. Uh, if the pump's not cycling, you know, are we still plugged in? Uh, you know, these drive lines, they're pretty durable, but, you know, they can get kinked, too. Um, we haven't with this system, but some of our adult systems, you know, these things kind of dangle off the side of the bed. We had a, a person come in one time pull up the side rail and cut the drive line right in half. And, you know, so the air is blowing out to the atmosphere and the patients, you know, not they're not creating any systoles at all. Uh, so, um, you know, check the connections, check the drive line, check the cannula, you know, or is the, and really, uh, when we get alarms, 99% of them are that the patient's just rolled over in a way that uh, kinks one of the cannulas and, uh, sets off the alarm. Uh, so, uh, uh, you can silence those alarms with the button here. Um, if you at least get the noise, or stop the noise, that brings everybody's anxiety level down by, uh, you know, a, a huge factor. So, get rid of the noise, but, you know, troubleshoot the thing. Uh, you know, you can read the messages here. Now, that one I just generated, it said pressure fault in system. One, one left, please wait. Oh, what's that mean? I mean, the messages are not necessarily very intuitive of, of to what's going on. <laughs> uh, so, reading those, eh, I don't know if it's going to help you that much. Uh, but, you know, you can certainly read them, but I, I don't know how much help they're going to be. Um, well, take corrective action immediately, uh, and we'll see what that's going to be. Now, like we said, if this thing fails, it, it's going to, you know, it's going to alarm, but it's going to continue to run. Uh, we would have to have multiple failures before the thing shut off. Uh, or before it stopped pumping, but if it uh, if it still seems to be pumping, but you're not 
seeing filling and emptying and you're confused, is the thing working, is it not? You know, one of the safest things you can do is get out the old hand pump. That eliminates that whole thing as a problem. All we have to do is pull the handle. It says out halfway, it really doesn't make any difference, but whatever, we'll go with the book. Pull it out halfway and then take the drive line, and I'm not going to disconnect that because it'll start uh, alarming, so I'll just use this. Take the drive line. Now, you know, she's on an LVAT, so we would plug it into the red side here. Red is left because it's oxygenated blood. Uh, the right side at heart has blue blood in it, so uh, plug it in and then start pumping. Now, we don't have to be concerned that, you know, this, this hand pump will <coughs> operate a 60 ml pump and it will operate a 10 ml pump. So do we have to sit 10 ml in, out, in, no. If we exert excessive pressure on that 10 ml pump, it will just, you can already hear it blowing that excess pressure overboard. So just cycle the thing, and her, she's running at 60 beats a minute, so 1,001, 1,002 will keep her going just fine. Look at the diaphragm. Are we cycling the diaphragm? Well, no, we're not hooked up here, but look at the diaphragm. Are you cycling it with your, with your hand pump? If you're not, <laughs> we got big issues then, don't we? Uh, we're not able to drive it from the outside. So, but uh, anyway, um, we're probably not going to have that issue. But, uh, what? You get to do that. You get to do that. Or who gets to? Like Anybody that needs to. Everybody, but no. <laughs> yeah. No, we'll all do that here in just a minute. Uh, at the bedside, though, whoever, usually, whoever usually needs to. Usually the nurses to. are the ones yeah. that are closest to the bedside, but if you see it happen and you're doing it, you're calling for help. Yep. Okay. Yeah, well, and help. What is help going to be? Well, you know, maybe somebody can look at the diaphragm because maybe the person with the hand pump, I mean, you'll be able to go like this for a while, mm -hmm. but I can tell you your arms are not going to last very long, and that's why they put these little things on the side. Now, you know, like this. You could do that all night long. And do that again, Kevin. To, Kevin, do that again. You can put your toe on it. I don't think I knew that. And cycle the pump like this, and it's much hmm. easier to do, other than you have to bend over. So I would get a chair, being a lazy perfusionist. Sit down, <laughs> and you can do that all day long, because I sit down all day long. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, the hand pump. And yeah, you'll all get to do that here. Uh... Yeah, you know, we'll do the switch over when it comes time to replace the console. It's not something you have to worry about. Uh, 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 like I said, this laptop uh, is not really part of the system. It, it can shut down. It's just a monitor. It doesn't affect the operation of the device when it's up and running. Uh, just to say a little bit about... Um, uh, ventricular assist device uh, in children. Uh, actually, we're getting more, uh, well, we might as well, we're kind of running out of time, but, uh, you know, let me, uh, there's a couple of studies of, of note, and you know, there aren't that many because, uh, you know, that's uh, uh, ventricular assist devices uh, uh, historically haven't been used that much in kids, but it, you know, but we're getting a, a bigger body of knowledge as that as we use more of these in kids. Uh, but one of the largest studies was done at the the hospital that um, developed this device, uh, and they had a total of 57 kids in their study. Uh, they had uh, eight myocarditis, 28 cardiomyopathies. Uh, 10 that had been on uh, bypass uh, before for some kind of congenital repair, uh, and then uh, 11 that were just end-stage congenital heart defects. Uh, their age range was from six, or the average, I don't want to say this wrong, the average age was six years, but the range was from two days to 16 years. Uh, and uh, the support time ranged from one day to 420 days, so the average support time was only 27 days, so, you know, not very long. 
uh, but uh, some of their kids were quite small. They had 23 LVADs and 34 BIVADs patients. Now, if we look at the overall survival, uh, the overall survival was only 54%, which, uh, you know, not real great. But if we break that down a little bit more uh, and look at the cardio uh, uh, myocarditis patients and the cardiomyopathy patients uh, separately, those had a 75% uh, survival rate. So that's a little more acceptable. Uh, so, like I say, these, uh, some of these complex end stage, uh, you know, they're, they're just not going to do well on these devices. Now, also, a little deeper look at their, um, at their experience. Their early experience here from 1990 to 97, and then later experience from 98 to 2003. In their early experience, they didn't have the small 10 ml pump, so they had no survivors in that small group. Uh, but later, once they developed that small pump, uh, they had 75% uh, uh, survival rate in that group. Uh, so, uh, again, we have to be able to size these things to the patient or they just don't work uh, and we don't get uh, survival. Also. Uh, if we uh, look at their early and late experience based on the, their disease type, um, the, the, post, uh, the patients that had been on cardiopulmonary bypass and had those uh, congenital complex uh, defects uh, were only 10% uh, survival in their early experience and slightly uh, better in their later survival up to about 35% or so. But uh, their uh, cardiomyopathies in uh, myocarditis patients had about the same 75% survival rate in their early and late experience. So if we use these devices for cardiomyopathies in uh, myocarditis patients, we'll probably have about a 75% uh, survival rate. Now, what was she? Our, what's our current patient? She's kind of one of those complex uh, patients. Um, but so far, so good. So uh, we'll see. Uh, recently, uh, let's see, New England Journal of Medicine uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, this uh, study is just out, comparing the Berlin Heart supported patients to ECMO uh, supported patients. A total of 48 patients, 24 in each group, uh, one in the 24 in the ECMO group, 24 in the LVAD, or in the, might have been BIVADs, I don't know, uh, group, uh, but in the VAD group. Uh, they had uh, cohorts, or they subdivided their patients then into patients with body surface area less than 0.7 millimeters, or millimeters, uh, meters squared, and patients greater are between a 0.7 and 1.5 meters squared. So they had big patients and small patients and compared those groups as well. Um, the small group, uh, they didn't reach the median survival because they were still on pump at 174 days. Uh, so, but the, the uh, median survival of the ECMO patient was 13 days in the small group. In the larger, in the larger patients or size group, uh, the mean survival uh, days for a patient was 144 on the VAD group and the ECMO group 10 days. So significantly uh, longer survival on VADs versus ECMO. Um, the uh, adverse events for those people that were on the VADs uh, 42% had major bleeding in the uh, small patient group, 50% in the large, so it's basically the same for both groups. Uh, infections, uh, about 60%, and uh, stroke, uh, around 30%. Uh, so, but the other thing to take away from this is, of those 48 patients, only 24 of them got BADS, right? They had 46 pump change outs. So that's two per patient. Now, some of them might have gotten six and some none, but an average two per patient 
So I don't think that we should be surprised when we need to change out a pump. Uh, you know, it's not the end of the world. Uh, uh, yeah, and we're, you know, even though we have to change a pump out, it doesn't mean we're not doing the right thing as far as anticoagulation, uh, and that it, it's a fairly common occurrence with these devices. So, uh, how do you get help if you need it? Scream. <laughs> uh, during business hours from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., use this pager number, 33958. Uh, you know, as a perfusionist, I'm running around the operating room, uh, you know, I'm not setting at a telephone. But some one of us is carrying that pager, and it, whatever time it takes them to run up here, or maybe they might even be at the CBC, but to get over here, that will be their response time. If you just have a question, you know, page them and, you know, just send the message. I have a question. It's not an emergency. Don't run. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if it's me, I know. <laughs> And if I don't show up, it's because I had a heart attack between here oh, and there. Oh, Kevin, no. <laughs> uh, anyway, use that. Um, and if you ever do page it and you don't get a response, let me know, and we'll get that corrected. But uh, it, it should work. You know, we've been carrying this thing for a number of years now. And, um, after hours, you're going to have to go through the paging system. Uh, it might be easier just to call the paging operator and say, call the operating room perfusionist uh, and let them do it. But if you want to do it, there's a pull-down list that says perfusion operating room. Uh, and then that will bring up uh, who are our people that are on call that, that night or that weekend. Now, I just learned something yesterday that that's in real time. <laughs> If we called, what time is it? Is it? It's not three o'clock. But if we called right now, those call people wouldn't be on there because it's not after three o'clock is when we go on call. Um, so uh, it's really of no good during the day. So use the pager. But um, on after five or after, actually after three, you can page us. And on the weekends, uh, you know, you can use that pull down list and then people's names and pager numbers will be there that are on call. Uh, so, uh, that's, uh, that's it, and uh, now we're going to create some alarms here, and you're going to come up and switch them over to the hand pump. So, uh, who's first? I'll this go. is my first week, you go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> this is your first week. <laughs> okay, so... Um, Here's our patient. Well, we'll we'll say, and I don't know if I'll be able to generate a line. Take two that. So we'll just say it's alarming like it did before, and you're going to switch over to the hand pump. Oh, thank pump. Actually, the hand pump is stored back here. It's got a couple of Velcro straps on it, so you have to retrieve it from underneath there. Right here I am. Uh, you have to retrieve it from under there, but uh, that's not that challenge. Now again, I'm not a big stickler on this, but the book says pull the thing halfway up. I, I can tell you it doesn't make any difference, but anyway, we'll go with the book, so pull it halfway up. But, uh, because what it, you know, uh, I'm not going to get into that. I was going to say, because it's already empty when you, as soon as you disconnect the line, the blood flows in there. Right, so and the pump will be full. But I can tell you, like I said, if you're at the wrong point of the stroke, if after two strokes, it'll be right. So you don't really have to do that. But don't tell me. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, okay. oh, you're quite welcome. So, stick that back. Well, continue to go off. What, the alarm? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you can silence it, but, it, you know, whatever was wrong with the console, no one fixed it, right? So it's going to be continuing to alarm. Once you're hand pumping, you might want to have somebody remove this console from the area. That way it's at least going to quiet down where someone can stand here and 
touch this thing every minute because that thing times out. Uh, all you're doing is, yeah. So, uh, 